Uh, hey guys, uh, my name is IBM and I am taking you through a series of AS Physics. Do not forget to like the videos. You can write your comments. You can always ask your questions. I'm always willing to uh, give you more explanation where possible and where necessary. Do not forget to uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you make it grow. So this is the Cambridge International Education. So this is particle physics, atoms, nuclei, and radiations. That is what you may call it for examination starting from 2022. And I think this is going to be lesson uh, lesson one. I mean lesson two, having seen lesson one. In lesson one, basically we concentrated on the alpha particle scattering experiment was the most important uh, concept that we explored in lesson one where we saw Rutherford's nuclear mode of the atom, which suggests that an atom is made up of a positively charged nucleus, which is surrounded by uh, negatively charged electrons that were revolving around the nucleus. We saw the evidence for the alpha particle scattering experiment of evidence for the nuclear model from the alpha particle scattering experiment, which suggests that most of the atom is entirely empty space. And this is because most of the alpha particles went straight through the gold foil. And then we said um, uh, most of the mass of an atom was concentrated in a very small positively charged nucleus, simply because a few alpha particles, that is one in 2,000 particles, were deflected through large angles greater than 90 degrees. We also looked at the scale of things. I think we also looked at the nuclear uh, nuclide notation where we said a nucleus or an atom could be represented as X, A, Z, where A was the nuclear number and Z was the proton number. I think we explored that in our lesson one. So in lesson two, I want us to concentrate on a new concept such as isotopes, then alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, so that we try to understand uh, these concepts even further. So uh, from what we saw, from what we saw uh, in, in the previous lesson, in lesson one, we saw the notation of uh, the alpha, we saw the notation, we saw the notation of a nuclide as X, A, Z. From your concepts or from your ideas of chemistry, your teacher must have told that the value of Z is the most important thing is the most important quantity which uh, explains a lot of things. In other words, the number of protons in an atom is very important or is very crucial, simply because it gives you the charge of the nucleus. It tells you the charge of the nucleus, and if it tells you, it tells you the charge, it therefore tells you the number of electrons which is needed for the atom to be neutral. And the number of electrons from chemical from your ideas of chemistry, you notice that the number of electrons governs how an atom behaves. 
and how an atom reacts uh, chemically with other atoms. In other words, the number of electrons gives uh, the atoms its properties. It gives you uh, the properties of that, uh, that atom and how it behaves with other atoms. Which means, if in case we make um, uh, the number of protons different, it means we have changed the, the ways in which an atom behaves or the ways in which it interacts or reacts chemically with other atoms. So change the number of protons, it is equivalent to changing the element because the atoms will be now behaving or the, uh, the atoms will be now, now behaving differently since they now have different proton number. So the number of protons makes the atom belong to a given particular element as you might, you might have mentioned in your chemistry. However, the number of neutrons is very is not very important. Remember we said number of neutrons is number of nuclear number minus number of protons. The number of nuclear neutrons may not be very, very important. You can change the number of neutrons without changing the charge of the atom or without changing the charge of the nucleus because the neutrons carry no charge. Therefore, changing the number of neutrons does not change the number of electrons, therefore does not change how the atom behaves. So does not change the element to which the atom belongs. So it means that it, there is a possibility of the same atom having the same proton number but different number of neutrons and therefore different number of nucleons. And that possibility leads us to what we shall call isotopes. So what are isotopes? So what I've been saying is very simple. The number of protons is very, very crucial. It gives you the charge of uh, the nucleus, and therefore it gives you the number of electrons needed for a neutral atom. It will give you the number of electrons which is needed for the atom to be neutral. And the number of electrons govern how an atom behaves and reacts chemically with other atoms. In other words, it gives you the properties of that atom. So the number of protons makes the atom to belong to a particular element. Because the number of protons determines the number of electrons to make the atom to be neutral, it means the number of, of protons will, uh, will make the atom belong to a particular element. The moment you change the number of protons, and you change, uh, the moment you change the number of protons, it would be equivalent to changing the, uh, the, uh, to changing the element itself because the number of protons will change the number of electrons needed for the atom to be neutral, and therefore it will change how the atom behaves or how the atom interacts with others. Therefore, the atom will be belonging to a different the atom will be belonging to a different element. However, like I've said, uh, you may change the number, you may change the number of neutrons without affecting the behavior of uh, the atom. So the number of neutrons in the nucleus is less crucial, it is less important. You can change the number of neutrons without changing the chemical properties of the atom. So it behaves in the same way even when it has more or less number of neutrons. Therefore, there are those nuclides, or call them atoms, of the same element. They will be of the same element because they are going to behave in the same way. So nuclides, or atoms of the same element with the same proton number, but different number of neutrons are going to be called isotopes. Same proton number, but different number of neutrons. Of course, this leads to different number of nucleons. These are called, going to be called isotopes. Atoms or nuclides of the same element with the same proton number but different number of, nu of, of, of neutrons, different number of neutrons are going to be called isotopes. By the way, what is a nuclide? A nuclide is one type of nucleus with a particular nuclear number and a particular proton number. That is what we call a nuclide. So if we have nuclides that have the same proton number, but different neutron, na neutron numbers or different number of neutrons, then we shall call them isotopes. What are some of the examples of isotopes? The common examples of isotopes are these ones, these three here. We may have mentioned them many times. So this is an isotope with one proton and one electron. Two protons, one electron. I mean, one proton, one neutron, and one electron. One proton, 
two neutrons and one electron. So we can write this as, because it's one proton and one electron, it means it has no neutron. So this one can be written as H11. This can be written as H because it has one proton but one neutron. Then this can be written as, okay, by the way, this is uh, going to be written as H. One, two, because there are two nu nucleons in the center, we have one, two. So this one will be written as H. These, these are three nucleons, but there's only one proton that is written as H31. So these are isotopes of hydrogen, where the first one is called the normal hydrogen. The normal hydrogen, H11, it is a single proton, it is a single nucleon. And we have the second one has two new two nucleons. We have one neutron and one proton. Those are two nucleons. This is called deuterium. Deuterium, this, de, this is coming from two. Deuterium. So an isotope of hydrogen, which, ha, which has two nucleons, that is deuterium. And then the other one is called tritium. Tritium should try from three. It has three nucleons but has only one proton. So in all cases, you notice that the proton number is remaining the same, but the number of neutrons is different, where the first one has zero neutron, this one has one neutron, the other one has two neutrons. So these ones are going to behave in the same way during chemical reactions, because they have the same number of protons, therefore they have the same number of electrons. It is these electrons that are responsible for chemical bonding, therefore, these are going to be called isotopes, nuclides of the same element, which have the same proton number, but different um, neutron number. These are going to be called isotopes. Self-check. Uranium has, an atomic, has atomic number 92. Two of its common isotopes have nuclear number, 235 and 238. Of course, we have uranium 238, we have uranium 235, by the way, we also have uranium 236, and so on and so forth. Determine the number of neutrons for these isotopes. These are very easy equations. So we have uranium, uranium U23592. So this one has uh, 92 protons, 235 uh, nucleons. So the number of neutrons is going to be the number of nucleons minus the number of protons. So that is 235 minus 92, which is 143. So uh, determine the number of neutrons for these isotopes. So uranium-235 is 143. And uranium-238, I think this is going to be 130, 146. So those are the number of uh, neutrons. Proton number is going to be the same. Uranium-238 will be written as U-238-92. Proton number is going to be the same. So as an assignment, research and write down the isotopes of carbon, oxygen, helium, and if you want, you can write many more. But what is very important is that if they are isotopes, they have the same proton number. Just to give a hint for carbon, for example, carbon is one of the elements with so many isotopes. You might have heard of carbon-12, you might have heard of carbon-13, uh, there's carbon-14. All these ones have proton number, I think, 6, and they are going to behave the same way. However, carbon-12 is most the most common because it is extremely uh, abundant and very stable. Then we have also carbon-14, which is commonly used for carbon dating, and so on and so forth. So you can research about uh, isotopes of oxygen, isotopes of helium, and, and many more. Of course, for helium, we have helium-3, helium-4. Those are isotopes. Same proton number, different neutron number. Complete the table below. This is a continuation of a self-check. These are IGCS equations, I think. Complete the table below number, nuclear number. I'll just choose one of these. Let me choose this one, calcium. So nuclear number. Remember, we are comparing with X, A, Z. A is the nuclear number. So nuclear number is 40. Proton number is 20. 
number of neutrons is going to be 40 minus 20, which is equal to 20. Then electron number, the number of electrons is the same as the number of protons. So since we have 20 protons, the number of uh, electrons is going to be 20. Okay. Um, let's check hydrogen one, one. Number of nucleons, that is one. Number of protons, that is one. Number of neutrons is one minus one, which is zero. Electrons, because there is one proton, the number of electrons is going to be one. So that is how we can complete this table. As an assignment, you can pause the video and try to complete the table just for practice. Okay, now let's go to the most important part of lesson two, which is going to be alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. Alpha, beta particles, and gamma radiations. This is the this is the gist of uh, this this lesson. Alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. We shall explore uh, these concepts more in uh, these uh, radiations more in nuclear physics of paper four. But at this point, we need to just know the basics of alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. In IGCSE, you must have mentioned these uh, particles and radiations. And your teacher must have told you that uh, when an unstable nucleus disintegrates on its own, it may disintegrate to gain stability by emission of alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. And your teacher must have told you in IGCSE that the emission of these particles is both spontaneous and random. And at that time, you may not have explained in details why it is what is meant by spontaneous and what is meant by random, but your teacher must have given you a clue that nothing in the environment influences this disintegration. That's what he called a spontaneous. And nothing in the environment I mean, uh, and we cannot predict uh, which nucleus in a given sample is going to disintegrate by emission of alpha, beta, or gamma radiations. And at that time, your teacher must have told you that the, uh, the process is considered to be random. So we are saying that unstable nuclei emit alpha, beta, or gamma radiations in order to become more stable. For example, uranium-238 or uranium-235 may be very unstable and it emits an alpha particle to become stable. Or it may emit beta particle to become stable. Or to give out a beta particle and a very stable a nucleus. As a result of emitting these radiations, the characteristics of the nucleus remaining is changed sometimes. Depending on which particle has been emitted, whether it is alpha, beta, or gamma, the characteristics of the nucleus which is remaining or the nucleus which is formed, which we shall later call the daughter nucleus, these characteristics may change depending on what has been emitted. So this is what we shall call radioactive decay or radioactivity, but this will be an A level, that is A2 content, that is going to be nuclear physics. That's when we shall see this as radioactivity or radioactive decay. However, the only thing we can mention is that the emission of these particles is going to be considered to be spontaneous. And in this case, spontaneous means it is not affected by external factors. Heating, uh, applying a catalyst, uh, applying pressure, any external factor in the environment will not influence this disintegration. This uh, emission of, of alpha, beta, and gamma radiation is not going to be influenced by any external factor or anything in the environment. So we shall say the emission of these radiations is spontaneous. We shall explore more about this in nuclear physics paper 4. Also, your teacher must have told that the emission of these particles and radiations is random. Something random cannot be predicted. Most of the things in life could be appearing random, but some of them could be predicted. Imagine tossing a die, uh, or imagine toss, tossing a dice, and you are sure that it will show a number between 1 and 6. But in one toss or in one throw, you may not predict which number it is going to show, unless it is a biased die or a biased dice. 
So we cannot predict which nucleus in a given sample is going to decay next. So I have a sample here which has several nuclei, but I can't single out any, I can't pull out one nucleus which I'm sure is going to decay next in a given sample. So we say uh, the emission of alpha, beta particles, or gamma radiations is random. So in nuclear physics paper, for we shall define radioactivity as being spontaneous and also random. Spontaneous in the, in the sense that it's not affected by external factors in the environment, such as temperature, pressure, chemical catalysts. And to be random in the sense that we cannot predict which nucleus in a given sample is most likely going to decay next. Okay, so the gist of this lesson is uh, exploring these three, alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. And let's start with alpha. Let's talk about alpha particles. Of course, I know you mentioned alpha particles in uh, your IGCSE, and I'm very sure alpha particle, you called alpha particles uh, a helium nucleus. So an alpha particle is actually a helium nucleus. So when someone talks about an alpha particle, of course, we, shall, we can write that, we can write alpha like that, alpha for two, or we can write it as a helium nucleus, which is He42. It is not He32. But an alpha particle is considered to be a helium nucleus. So what does that mean? Because we saw the notation of a nuclide, the nuclide notation as X, A, Z. It means uh, the proton number of an alpha particle is 2. And remember, the number of protons is the charge of the nucleus. So this is going to give us a charge of positive 2E. The nucleon number, by the way, is going to be, the number of nucleons is going to be actually the mass in unified atomic mass units for a nucleus. So for an alpha particle, the mass is going to be 4, but U, unified atomic mass. Because if you recall, a proton had a mass of 1U, and a neutron had the mass of 1U. An alpha particle has two protons and it has two neutrons. So it has 2 plus 2. So that means the total mass of an alpha of a helium nucleus is going to be 4U. So an alpha particle is a helium nucleus and it has a charge of that. So it can pass through very thin paper. An alpha particle can pass through very, very thin paper, but it is unable to penetrate, but is unable to penetrate thin cut, a cut that is relatively uh, stronger. Therefore, it has or oh, it has low penetrating power. So have low penetration power, low penetrating power. Has low penetrating uh, power. So alpha particles have low penetrate penetration power, not low penetration power. So alpha particles have low penetration power. They can pass through very thin paper, but they have low uh, penetration power. And because they have low penetration power, we shall later on see that they can even easily be absorbed by air, and therefore they have a small range in air. But they have a charge of positive 2E. So they have a strong positive charge of positive 2E, and of course a mass of 4U, where U Remember, 1U is 1.66 times 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms. That is 1U as we discussed in lesson 1. So the mass of an alpha particle is four times the mass of a single proton. Thus, because alpha particles are positively charged, they can be attracted to a positive... Uh, They can be attracted, thus attracted to positive uh, to a positive plate. Thus attracted to actually this is negative, not positive. Thus attracted to a negative plate, as we shall see later on. So because alpha particles are positively charged, the alpha particles are going to be attracted to a negative plate, not a positive plate. Because after all, like charges repel, unlike charges attract. So alpha particles being positively charged, they are attracted to a negative plate. 
Because they have charge, we expect alpha particles to undergo ionization. We shall explain ionization in more detail. So they ionize in air. And by the way, among the three alpha, beta, and gamma radiations, these are going to be the most highly ionizing. Most highly ionizing. The alpha particles are the most highly ionizing because later on we are going to see that ionization depends on charge. And the alpha particles have the biggest charge, which is positive 2E, and therefore they are going to be the most ionizing. Ionization depends on charge. Okay. So what happens when an, a nucleus decays by emission of alpha particles? So when a nucleus, when the nucleus of an atom emits an alpha particle, it is said to undergo what we shall call the alpha decay. When a, a nucleus gives out or emits an alpha particle to gain stability, the decay is going to be called an alpha decay. In an alpha decay, the proton number of the nucleus is supposed to decrease by two and uh, the nuclear number is going to is supposed to decrease by uh, by 4 so for an uh, for an alpha decay we expect the proton number to decrease by 2 and the nuclear number to decrease by 4 that is if we have uh, a nucleus x which is x a z and it, go, it undergoes an alpha decay where an alpha is written as alpha 4 2 we expect that a new nucleus formed, its uh, nuclear number is therefore A minus 4, and its proton number is therefore Z minus 2. So the proton number is expected to reduce by 2, and the nuclear number is expected to decrease by 4, because for every nuclear reaction, as we shall see, the total nuclear number should remain the same, and total proton number on both sides of the equation are going, is, are going to remain the same, or is going to remain the same. So each element, each element has a particular proton number and therefore alpha decay causes one element to change into another. For example, if this was Z and the new element is Z minus 2 in proton number, when the proton number changes, it means the element formed is completely different from the first one because each element has a particular number of protons. So Alpha decay or an alpha decay results into change of the element completely because the proton number changes. This process is scientifically called transmutation. The process is commonly called transmutation. In other words, the original nuclide is called the parent nuclide and it, it transforms into a new one which we are going to call the daughter nuclide later on. So that is called transmutation. So, so the parent nuclide and lotter nuclei do not behave the same way because they have different number of protons. That is what happens with an alpha particle. A simple example of an alpha decay is the one I'm, I've demonstrated here with uranium. So uranium-234 is going to act as the parent nuclei. May emit an alpha particle, remember alpha is now 42, or you can write it as HE42. The daughter nuclide is going to be thorium-230. In addition, energy is released. Of course, energy always accompanies such reactions. This emission is represented by the equation uranium-234-92 decaying to give us thorium-230-90 plus helium plus energy. And one important thing you need to notice is, is that the proton number on the left-hand side is 92. The proton number on the right hand side is 90 plus 2, which is 92. The nuclear number is 234. The nuclear number on the right hand side is 230 plus 4, which is 234. This is accompanied by energy. So I want you to note that the atomic mass of the decay products is less than that of the parent nuclide. Of course, people cannot see the atomic mass here because you are seeing the proton number is balanced. But the atomic mass of the decay products is less than that of the parent nuclear. That's why we expect energy to be emitted, because in nuclear physics, we shall see that if the total mass of the products on the right-hand side is less than the mass of the parent on the left-hand side, then energy is going to be uh, emitted so that mass, energy, 
is conserved. The emission of energy is, is telling us the total mass of the products is less than the mass on the left hand side. So the energy which is emitted compensates, it compensates for the difference in energy. So the equivalent, the energy equivalent of the difference in the mass appears as kinetic energy of the thorium and the alpha particle, or the kinetic energy of the thorium of the alpha particle and the requiring the daughter nuclide, and maybe in form of a gamma photon. So the energy which is emitted here is going to be either kinetic energy of these products, or it is going to be a gamma photon, because gamma photon is entirely electromagnetic radiation, which is energy. Therefore, we scientifically say that mass energy is conserved. Mass energy is conserved. Mass energy is conserved. We don't say mass conserved, we don't say energy conserved. It is one quantity which is mass energy. So mass energy is conserved in all nuclear processes. Mass energy is conserved. So a few things to take away from here, a few things we need to note from this slide. In all nuclear processes, the following are conserved. One, we have mentioned nuclear number. We have been balancing the number of nucleons on the left-hand side with the number of nucleons on the right-hand side. And the proton number, we have balanced the number of protons on the left and the right of the equation. When I talk about proton number, this is equivalent to saying charge, because the charge uh, the number of protons determines the charge of the nucleus. The number two, we have also said, uh, if there's a difference in mass, energy is, energy is emitted to compensate for the difference in mass. And that's what we, we call mass energy being conserved. Of course, for all reactions, for all processes, momentum is conserved. These three are always conserved in every nuclear process. Total momentum remains constant. If the system is isolated, mass energy is conserved, nuclear number and proton number are always conserved. So one important thing we need to note is that the alpha particles emitted from particular radioactive nuclide have discrete energies. What do I mean by discrete energies? Alpha particles emitted in any reaction, alpha particles emitted in any radioactive process, have the same amount of energy. Alpha particles emitted in any process, any radioactive process, have the same amount of energy. They will have the same kinetic energy. So we say they have discrete energies. So if five alpha particles are emitted, each alpha particle has the same energy as the other. So we say alpha particles are emitted with discrete energies. Later on, we shall see beta particles emitted with a continuous range of energies, but alpha particles are emitted with discrete energies. So if I was to sketch a graph of uh, alpha particles, number of alpha particles, number of alpha particles against energy. If I was to sketch a graph of al the number of alpha particles against energy, it is just going to be a vertical line like this one here. It is going to be a vertical line. Why? Why is it a vertical? The vertical line is showing a constant amount of energy. Why is it a vertical line? It's because alpha particles are always emitted by with the, from uh, alpha particles from a particular radioactive substance or radioactive nuclide are always emitted with the same amount of energy. So they're always emitted with the discrete energies. So those are the alpha particles. And by the way, one important thing I don't want to forget is that because they are highly ionizing, alpha particles travel a very short distance in air and they are easily absorbed. So we say they have a small range in air and their range in air is approximately, the range in air is approximately range in air is approximately six centimeters. Because they are highly ionizing, because of their charge, they have a small range in air. They travel a very short distance and they lose all their energy. That's what we call being highly ionizing. So those are the alpha 
particles. Okay, let's now talk about the beta particles. Let's explore the beta particles. What is special about beta particles? What are these beta particles? I know in IGCSE you called beta particles electrons and you called beta particles as being negatively charged. Unfortunately, at this level, we shall still call beta particles electrons, but we shall have beta particles which are positively charged and beta particles which are negatively charged. The positively charged beta particles, we shall call them positrons, and the negatively charged particles, we shall call them the normal electrons. So the positrons are going to be considered as the ant electrons, the ant electrons, having the same charge as the electrons, but uh, I mean, having the same mass as the electrons, but just opposite charges to that of the electrons. So what are beta particles? Beta particles are going to be defined to be the fast moving electrons. They travel at a very high speed. Their speed is up about uh, 0 0.99, the speed of light. Of course, the speed of alpha particles is very small, about 0.005 C as we shall summarize in one of the tables, but beta particles are fast moving electrons. They travel at almost the speed of light. So a radioactive substance or a radioactive nucleus that decays by beta decay may emit either beta minus, that is the negative beta particle, or beta plus, that is the positive beta particle, which is called the positive electron. So we now know today, apart from what you mentioned in IGCSE, that now we have both a positive electron and a negative electron. And in IGCSE, you only emphasized, uh, your emphasis was only on the negative electron. So the positive, the positive, the positive electron, which is beta plus, is going to be known as a positron, which will later on, or we can call an ant electron. Ant, which means it has opposite charge to that of the electron. So beta plus is always going to be called a positron. It is an electron with a positive charge. So when we say ant, we are referring to opposite. Ant electron, opposite electron, opposite of the electron. So it has the same mass as the electron, but it will have an opposite charge. That's why we are calling it ant electron. So these ones can penetrate the card. Beta particles can pass through a, a thin sheet of, of, of paper. They can go ahead and penetrate card. Uh, they can travel even through a thin layer of aluminium, but they can travel just up to a few millimeters thick of aluminium. So they can penetrate card and sheets of aluminium up to a few millimeters thick. So as the thickness of aluminium increases, they can now be stopped, but for a few millimeters, they can still penetrate through. So we can say these ones are more penetrating than alpha particles, because alpha particles would easily be stopped by a piece of card. So these ones can travel through air. By the way, these ones will have a wide range in air, about 2.0 meters in air. So these ones are going to be less ionizing as we are going to see later on. So what is their charge? Because beta, uh, these ones are, have a charge, either beta plus or beta minus, because they have charge, then they are going to be ionizing too. We shall be writing them as either beta plus, which is zero one, or beta minus, which is beta minus, which is zero, negative one. Or we can write this as E, zero, one, which is bit, still beta plus, or a positive electron, or which is an anti-electron. Or we shall write uh, the electron as zero, negative one, that is a normal electron. So these ones have charge, either positive or negative, but it is smaller in magnitude compared to the charge of an alpha particle, which was positive to E. So we shall say that these ones are less ionizing. These ones are less ionizing. Depending on whether it is positive or negative, it will be attracted to a positive or negative plate, but these are going to be less ionizing. So these ones are less ionizing, but 
they are also ionizing just like the alpha particles. So we can say that their charge means that they are affected by electric and magnetic fields. Because they have charge, they are going to be deflected in an electric and magnetic fields. From your IGCSE, any charged particle is always affected by a magnetic field and an electric field. For an electric field, whether the particle is moving or not, it is going to be affected by the electric field. For a magnetic field, to be, uh, the particle must be moving, and we shall see that in, magnetic, uh, in a unit called magnetic fields. The particle is supposed to be moving at an angle to the magnetic field for it to experience a magnetic force. So the, we said they are deflected or they are affected by electric and magnetic fields. It is the same thing with alpha particles because they have charge. So beta minus particles may carry negative charge or positive charge and thus may be deflected in the same direction or opposite direction to the positively charged alpha particle. If it is beta positive, it is going to be deflected in the same direction as the positively charged alpha particle. If it is beta negative, it is deflected in the opposite direction to that of the alpha particle. A beta minus uh, particle may be emitted from, say, a uh, lead 214. Remember, I said when we write the, uh, uh, when we denote the nuclide like that, or the nucleus like that, the 214 is going to be the nuclear number. The daughter nuclide could be bismuth 214. And in addition, energy is, energy is released. So this, this is showing us that a beta particle has been emitted, the nuclear number has not changed, but because beta is either positive one or negative one in charge, then the proton number is expected to, to have changed. Let's check the beta of, of lead to understand what we mean by beta, beta minus or beta plus decay. So, a beta minus decay may be emitted. I mean, a beta minus particle may be emitted from a lead 214 nucleus. The daughter nuclide is bismuth 214, and in addition, energy could be released. And this could be represented by this equation here. So, if it is beta minus lead, is written like that. It is giving us bismuth and beta minus particle. This is beta minus particle. Normally, beta, a beta minus particle is accompanied by another particle that I will mention later on, and this is accompanied by the release of energy. When I see release of energy, it's because total mass of these products is less than the mass on the left-hand side. So the difference in mass is compensated for by emission of energy on the right-hand side. So we can check the nuclear number, 214214. Proton number 82 on the left. 83 plus negative 1, which is 82 on the, on the right. Then if there is if there's emission of energy, it's only because total mass of the products is less than the mass of the parent nucleus. So the same would be the same equation is sometimes written as a lead 21482 bismuth. Instead of writing E0 minus 1, you just write beta minus. And this is accompanied by this particle here. This particle here is called the ant neutrino. So when I write, sometimes it's written just like this, with an E there, to mean it is electron ant neutrino. In a full, it is supposed to be electron ant neutrino. Now you notice that we didn't see such accompanying particles with uh, we didn't see such accompanying particles with uh, with uh, alpha particles. We didn't see such accompanying particles when we we're talking about alpha. That means there is a problem here, and that problem could be accounted for by the fact that the energy of uh, the energy which uh, is emitted by different beta particles, or the energy which is emitted during, uh, during beta decay may not be discrete because different uh, particles are going to accompany the emission of beta particles. Like we have seen, an antineutrino is accompanying the emission of beta minus, which we did not expect. 
So it's like the energy of beta minus is not going to be discrete throughout, as we saw with uh, uh, the alpha particles. The energy of beta may not be discrete or may not be constant, as we saw with um, as we saw with uh, the alpha particles. So this is beta minus decay. Let's check out beta plus beta plus decay. So a beta plus particle may be emitted from phosphorus 30 nucleus. The daughter nuclide is silicon 30, and in addition, energy is released. So we can write this as a lead, uh, phosphorus 3015. Um, this is giving us a silicon 3014 plus. This is beta plus. And of course, the same equation, the same equation can be written as phosphorus instead of uh, E01, you can write as beta plus like that, or you can instead write beta plus like this 01. It is still allowed. I could still put a zero here and a one here. That is beta plus. Now, another particle is accompanying the emission of beta plus, and this is the particle which does not have a bar on top. This particle here is called the electron neutrino. Electron neutrino. So it also means the energy which is emitted is going to be shared between the beta particles and the accompanying electron neutrino. So it also means the energy is not going to be uniform because different particles, beta particles, are most likely going to be uh, emitted with a different amounts of energy since some of the energy is going to be taken up or is going to be shared with accompanying particles. Some of the energy is going to be shared with uh, the accompanying particles. Okay. So a few things we need to note from what we have just discussed here. A few points we need to note. Number one, recall that the nucleus contains only protons and neutrons. So ask yourself a question. Where do the beta particles come from? We call them fast-moving electrons. So what then is the origin of beta particles, of beta particle emission? The nucleus, as proposed by the nuclear model, contains only protons. So inside the nucleus, we only have protons plus neutrons. Surrounded by electrons revolving around the nucleus for an atom. The question is, why are we calling beta particles fast-moving electrons? By the way, all particles alpha, beta, and gamma radiations originate from the nucleus. It is the nucleus which is not stable that is going to disintegrate to emit either alpha or beta or gamma to gain stability. But inside the nucleus, we don't have, we don't have electrons. So what is the origin of beta particles, or beta minus, or beta plus? So we are saying... Each beta particle certainly comes from the nucleus, not from the electrons outside the nucleus, but from the nucleus, even when we don't have uh, electrons inside the nucleus. But how is that possible? This is exactly what happens. During beta emission, a neutron in the nucleus forms a proton. A neutron in the nucleus changes into a proton. In other words, we lose a nucleus as we gain a proton. This is going to be a, uh, this is going to give us a negative electron. Certainly, it will give us a negative electron, and a negative electron because it is a normal electron. A normal particle is always accompanied by an antiparticle, which we shall call an antineutrino. So, what I'm saying is that inside the nucleus, a neutron is changing into a proton. When I try to balance the equation, proton number is zero on the left-hand side. The only way it can be zero on the right-hand side is by addition of a beta minus particle, because plus one and negative one gives us zero. So that means proton number is conserved. Nuclear number on the left-hand side is one. Then for the right-hand side is should be one plus zero, which is one. 
This is going to be accompanied by an ant neutrino or an ant electron neutrino. Now, students normally write this as V, but it's written like this. That is an ant, an ant a neutrino. Of course, this is accompanied by energy. Or sometimes this could be written as uh, instead of E0 minus 1, you just write beta minus. Of course, this is accompanied by an ant neutrino and energy. So this leaves, uh, this leaves the nucleus with the same number of nucleons as before because it is just we just lost one neutron as we gained one proton. That means the number of neutrons has reduced by one, but the number of protons has increased by one, which means total number of nucleons has not changed. But since we have one extra proton and one fewer prot one fewer neutron, perhaps what has been formed is relatively a different nucleus. So this is how the beta particles are coming from the nucleus. They are not coming from the electrons around the nucleus but they are being suddenly emitted suddenly as the neutron changes to a proton. So as the neutron changes to a proton, we get a beta minus particle. In a similar way, as a proton changes to a neutron, we shall get a beta plus particle. So in beta plus emission, a proton in the nucleus forms a neutron. So this time it is a proton changing into a neutron. And if we try to balance that kind of equation, if a proton is changing to a neutron, when you try to balance proton number, on the left you have one, on the right you have zero, so you must add a beta plus, so that the proton number is, is, is one. On the total proton number on the right hand side is also the same as that on the left. The number of nucleons on the right hand side, on the left we have one, it should also be one on the other side. But like I mentioned, this is an antiparticle which is going to be called a positron. This is a positive electron because the charge is plus one, so this is called a positron. So the positron is in a positive particle. A positive particle cannot be accompanied by an antiparticle because this is already an anti-electron. Because it is already an ant electron, it cannot be accompanied by an antineutrino, so it is accompanied by a neutrino. So this is accompanied by a neutrino. Sometimes you may write this as, as something like this. Instead of writing E01, you may write beta plus, um, sometimes you could also put E0 and the 1 there, it is still acceptable, but this is accompanied by uh, a neutrino. In all cases, energy is emitted, but remember this energy is not going to be discrete because of these uh, strange accompanying particles that we have mentioned. So this leaves, uh, this also leaves the nucleus with the same number of nucleons as before, but with one extra neutron. So we have increased the number of neutrons, but we now have fewer protons. So if the number of protons has reduced, so it means the new uh, element which has been formed is totally different because the number of protons has been affected. So that is what we call a beta plus emission. So in both cases, either a proton changes into a neutron, but within the nucleus, or a neutron changes into a proton within the nucleus. And the process is going to result into sudden emission of beta plus or beta minus particles as we have described uh, before. That is beta plus and beta minus emission. In conclusion, so in beta minus decay, the negative electron, a daughter nuclide is formed with the proton number increased. So we have seen a proton number is increased because a neutron a neutron has changed into a proton. It's increased by one, but with the same number of, with the same nuclear number. And in beta plus decay or positive electron, 
a daughter nuclide is formed with a proton number decreased because remember it is a proton becoming or changing to a neutron so the proton number is decreased in beta plus decay but the same but number of nucleons remains the same that is beta plus decay a few important uh, things to uh, explore on or expand on here number one the antimatter particle which is the positive electron which we are going to call the positron The positron very quickly meets its equivalent matter particle, which is the negative electron. The two particles annihilate. They annihilate each other to produce a gamma radiation. We shall talk about annihilation uh, in, in, uh, in medical physics, especially in the positron emission tomography. That is paper four. So the beta plus, which is E plus, immediately meets it is going to meet uh, its corresponding beta minus, which is E minus. This is a positron. This is, this is the antiparticle of the other one. When they meet, what their mass becomes energy. In, in fact, their mass is going to give us two gamma photons, as, as we shall describe in, part in, um, in medical physics or in positron emission tomography. The positron, which is beta plus, and the electron, the normal electron, or which is the negative electron, they immediately meet each other and their mass becomes energy in form of gamma photons. And this is what we are going to call annihilation. They annihilate each other to produce a gamma radiation. They will give us two gamma photons, their mass becomes energy. This makes the positive electron difficult to detect. So the positive electron is normally not uh, easily detected in everyday experiments because it always immediately finds a corresponding uh, particle or a, because it is an antiparticle, it immediately finds its equivalent matter particle and the annihilate, forming energy in form of gamma ray photons. So the atomic mass of the K products is always less than the mass of the parent nucleus. That's why energy is emitted. Total mass on the right hand side is always less than the mass of the parent nucleus and therefore energy is emitted to compensate for the difference in energy. But the energy equivalent, the energy equivalent of the energy equivalent of the difference in mass is shared between the kinetic energy of the beta particle and the recoiling daughter nucleus and the energy of the neutrino or the antineutrino. And therefore, we say that mass energy is conserved. Because I mentioned that in all nuclear reactions, mass energy is conserved. In all nuclear reactions, mass energy is conserved. So, because total mass of the products is less than the mass of the reactants or the mass of the parent nucleus, to compensate for the difference in mass, energy is emitted which is emitted as kinetic energy of the products and that energy, I mean kinetic energy of the products, which include the beta minus, the, uh, the daughter nucleus and the neutrino. And therefore we say mass energy is always conserved in every nuclear reaction. I want you to also note that beta particles will have a range of energies. I think I gave an, I, I mentioned, uh, I talked about uh, alpha particles having discrete energies. Unfortunately, beta particles are going to be emitted with a range of energies. And the reason is very simple because the energy with which they are emitted or the energy which is emitted during the reaction is normally shared with the accompanying particles such as the electron neutrino and the electron antineutrino. So the neutrino and the antineutrino will take part of uh, their energy or will take part of the energy which is emitted during the reaction. Not all the energy goes to the, uh, the products as we saw with uh, alpha particle decay. Here some of the energy is taken by the accompanying particles which we did not expect such as the neutrinos and anti-neutrino. One important thing you, note, you need to note is 
When I talk about the antineutrino, it is the antiparticle of the neutrino. An antiparticle always has uh, the same mass but opposed charge to the corresponding particle. For example, a positron is positive and an electron is negative. So a positron is the antiparticle of an electron or a normal electron. After all, even the positron is a positive electron. Now somebody will say, but why is the, uh, why is the antineutrino uh, the antiparticle of the neutrino, yet the neutrino has no charge? So after this, the discovery of the positron as being the antiparticle of the, of the electron, scientists just predicted that every particle must be having its corresponding antiparticle, including those particles which do not have charge. Even though the basis to which they used to, uh, uh, to discover the positron was charge, and they used that basis to define the meaning of antiparticle or antimatter, the, quant the theory of quantum dynamics predicted that every particle is created with its corresponding antiparticle. That's why if we have a neutrino, we expect to have the antineutrino. So the production of neutrinos and antineutrinos in beta decay allows for a continuous range of energies, but alpha particles have discrete energies. So if you compare the graphs of, for example, uh, for alpha, we saw that for alpha, graph of a number of alpha particles against energy was a vertical line. If I sketch the same graph for a uh, number of beta particles against, against energy, this may not be a vertical line. It could be a range of energies. So this could be a range of energies because these are accompanied by other particles such as neutrinos and antineutrinos. And the production of the neutrinos and antineutrinos in beta decay allows for a continuous range of energies because the energy with which the particles or the energy which is emitted during the reaction is being shared with those other particles. That's what we mean by beta particles having a continuous range of energies. Example. Here's a simple example. A strontium-90 atom decays with the emission of a beta-minus particle to form a daughter nuclide yttrium-90. The decay is represented by the nuclear equation. What is the nuclear equation? Okay, by that nuclear equation. Then state and explain whether the beta particle is negative or positive electron. State the type of particle represented by X. So because this is a beta particle, we try to just balance uh, the nuclear number is zero here. And the proton number, because this is 39 and this is 38, we must make this to the total on the right hand side to be 38. So this should be negative one. And because this is a normal electron, this is a normal electron. The normal electron is always accompanied by an anti-electron. So this is going to be uh, the anti-neutrino. Therefore, X is the antineutrino and the particle is beta minus. This is accompanied by the energy. So the proton number has increased by one. We see the proton number has increased by one, which means a neutron has changed into a proton. Hence, a negative electron is emitted. Then X is going to be the antineutrino as it is the particle that accompanies the negative electron. Because the proton number has increased, it means a neutron has changed into a proton to increase the proton number. So if we just balance the equation, we can even see that is beta minus. And beta minus, I mean, beta minus is a normal particle. A normal particle is accompanied by an antiparticle. That's why I say X is going to be the antineutrino. Okay. So having explored uh, beta particles and alpha particles, let's also talk about gamma radiation. Let's talk about gamma rays or gamma radiations. Of course, we know from um, Reed's mother is visiting Uncle Xavier's garden. We know that gamma radiations, those are electromagnetic radiations. 
So this is actually electromagnetic waves because they belong to the electromagnetic spectrum. So we shall simply say gamma radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum with wavelengths between a 10 to the power of minus 11 meters to around 10 to the power of uh, 13 meters. Because this is a, a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, it is entirely energy. And energy, for energy, we cannot talk about mass, so it has no mass. We can also not talk about charge, so it has no charge. So gamma radiations have no charge, thus its ionizing power is much less than that of alpha or beta. Because ionization depends on charge, gamma radiations which have no charge, their ionizing power is going to be very small because it will now only depend on energy rather than charge. So it is going to be very, 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 very small as compared to alpha particles and beta particles. But gamma radiations are very penetrating because they are very energetic. They penetrate almost everything. That's why they are even used in the positron emission scans. That is the PET, positron emission tomo tomograph. So they are very, very penetrating. They are more penetrating than beta and they are more penetrating than uh, gamma. These ones can penetrate through thin paper. They can penetrate through card. They can penetrate through aluminium. They can penetrate several centimeters of air, several meters of air. They have unlimited thickness of air. They can penetrate almost unlimited thickness of air. And they can travel several or penetrate through several meters of concrete, only to be stopped by uh, thick materials of lead. So they can penetrate several centimeters of concrete, even several centimeters of lead. Only a thick material of lead can stop them. Those are the gamma radiations, very penetrating, very strong. A few things we need to note about gamma radiations. Number one, in a gamma emission, no particles are emitted and there is therefore no change in the proton number or nucleon number of the parent. Here there is no particle emitted, it is just energy. A particle, a parent nucleus X, whose nucleon number is A, proton number is Z, just sheds off some energy in form of gamma radiations to form another nucleus, say Y, whose nuclear number is going to remain A and proton number is going to remain Z because gamma is just energy, so no change in mass, no change in proton number. Therefore, Y and X are still going to behave the same way. So, there is no change in the proton number or nuclear number of the parent nuclear when a nucleus decays by emission of gamma photons. For example, when uranium-235 decays by emission of an alpha particle, the, result, the resulting nucleus was thorium, and it contains excess energy. So thorium contains excess energy. It is said to be in an excited state. Then thorium can emit photons of gamma radiation to return to the ground state. So we started with um, uranium to get thorium. Here, there was a change from uranium to thorium. But then, thorium is still unstable. It just sheds off energy in form of gamma photons to form a more stable thorium. So, the, the thorium which is emitted by um, here, which, is, which results after the emission of gamma photons, is going to be stable. But the proton number is the same and the nuclear number is the same. So, it, is, it behaves in the same way. The star that I've put on those, the star on thorium on the left hand side of the equation just shows that thorium nucleus is in an excited state. In other words, it has excess energy. Therefore, it has to shed off that energy in order to gain stability. So the energy is going to be given off in the form of uh, gamma photons. But the thorium which is emitted has the same properties as the previous thorium. That is what happens during gamma decay or during the emission of gamma radiations. The nuclear number does not change and the proton number does not change. So that is gamma radiations. So we have mentioned this is electromagnetic radiation, uh, no charge, no mass, but less ionizing because it has no charge, but extremely penetrating. It is very energetic and penetrating. And by the way, this being gamma radiations, it is going to travel at the same speed as light. That is approximately 1.0 C. 
where c is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Because it's an electromagnetic radiation, therefore it travels at the speed of light. So it means the fastest is gamma radiations, followed by beta particles and finally electrons. I mean, uh, finally alpha particles. That is their order. The most, uh, the most penetrating is gamma radiations, followed by beta particles and finally alpha particles. But the most ionizing is alpha particles followed by a beta particles, then finally gamma radiations because of, of the charge, because of the charge. Okay. So let's have a summary of all these three part these three radiations in one in one table. So we have a property, and we shall see whether it applies to alpha or how it applies to alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. Where does it come from? That is the property. All alpha, beta, and gamma radiations originate from the nucleus. It is the unstable nucleus which disintegrates to emit alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. What is the nature of the radiation or particle? An alpha particle is a helium nucleus. I said you can write as HE42 or write as alpha42. Beta particle is a negative or positive electron. These are fast moving electrons. Then uh, gamma radiations is actually electromagnetic, short wavelength electromagnetic radiation. It is electromagnetic radiation. What is the mass of the of the of the of the radiation or the emission? An alpha particle. He42, the mass is for you. A beta particles being electrons, we have seen from lesson one that the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kilograms, which is approximately the same as 0.0005 U, which is the same as 1 over 1840 U, or it may be written as 1 over, uh, you may find it written as 1 over 2000 U. So, the mass is 1 over 1840 U. Gamma radiations have no mass. Then charge. We have seen that an alpha particle, because it's He42, the charge is positive E. Beta particle, if it is beta minus, the charge is negative E. If it is beta plus, the charge is positive E. Gamma radiations being energy, they have no charge. Speed. Alpha particles have a speed of up to about 0.05C. That is the speed of alpha particles. They have the smallest speed. Beta particles have a speed of approximately 0.99 c or more than 0.99 c, where c is the speed of light. Gamma radiations being electromagnetic waves, they travel the speed of light. What can it pass through? Of course, alpha particles can pass through about their range. We say range in air is about 6 centimeters. These ones, the uh, the range in air is several meters of air. This is approximately two meters. These ones can travel about two meters in air without being absorbed. These ones can pe penetrate almost anything. Unlimited uh, meters in air. Unlimited meters in air. Then what will stop it? We said alpha particles can easily be stopped by a piece of paper as long as it's thick enough. Or any thick material can stop alpha particles. Beta particles can penetrate paper, can penetrate card. They can penetrate a lot of thick materials, but they can easily be stopped by uh, several centimeters of aluminium. So they can still penetrate aluminium, but can easily be stopped by about three millimeters of aluminium. The skin can also stop beta particles. Alpha gamma radiations can penetrate paper, can penetrate aluminium, only to be reduced by thick lead. If we want to stop gamma radiations, the lead should be thick enough because they can travel several centimeters through concrete and through a lead, unless it is extremely thick. So only reduced by thick lead and concrete. Then penetrating power. Alpha particles have the least penetrating power. They have uh, they have um, a small range of few centimeters of air. 
Then a beta particle is slightly good penetrating power, a few millimeters of aluminium, they can go through paper, air, they can even go a few millimeters of aluminium, that is how strong they are. These ones can penetrate, they are very penetrating, they can even penetrate a few centimeters of lead, even concrete. So that means they can go through paper, they can go through aluminium, and so on and so forth. Relative ionizing effect. Remember, ionizing effect depends on charge. So this is going to be the strongest. This is going to be weak, and this is going to be very weak. It is the strongest because of the charge, positive E. This is relatively weak because it has a relatively smaller charge, but this is very weak because it has no charge. No charge. It makes it weak. Then are they deflected by electric and magnetic fields? Alpha has charge, so anything with the charge is deflected by electric and magnetic fields. Because gamma radiations have no charge, they have no effect when a passed through a magnetic, an electric and magnetic field. Then what happens to when they fall in a photographic film? All of them will cause the photographic film to change, even though you may not focus much on the photographic film effect. So that is a summary of all those radiations. In an exam, or when you prepare for, as you prepare for an exam, you just need to master this and summarize this table in your own ways. That means will be this table has everything you need to know about alpha, beta, and gamma radiations in terms of properties. One of the things we need to know that beta particles have the largest charge to mass ratio compared to alpha particles. Beta particles have the largest charge to mass ratio compared to alpha particles. If we compare the charge to mass ratio, that is charge divided by mass ratio, So for beta, for beta, the ratio is going to be called the charge for beta is, is just going to be, I will just check one e either plus or minus, divide, divide by the mass. The mass of beta is 1 over 1840 times u, which means this is going to give us a 1840 e times u. That is if I leave the E and U there. Then compare with the alpha. For alpha, it is going to be the, the charge is positive 2E and the mass is 4U. So this gives us 0 0.5 E times U. So you notice that beta particles have the largest charge to mass ratio if you compare with, um, if we try to compare this with uh, alpha particles. Let's try to arrange these in terms of um, ionization, in terms of range in air, in terms of uh, penetrating, in terms of speed. I can arrange them in ascending order. Ionization is going to be gamma, followed by a beta, followed by alpha. Range in air. Shortest range is alpha, followed by beta, followed by gamma. Penetrating power. Smallest is alpha, followed by beta, followed by gamma. Speed. The smallest is alpha, followed by beta, followed by gamma. That is how we can range them in ascending order in terms of ionization range, uh, speed, penetrating power, ETC. Okay. So what is the meaning of ionization? I've been talking about ionization many times, so I just want to give to explain to people what we mean by ionization. Ionization is the process by which an atom or group of atoms become charged when they lose or gain electrons. So because alpha particles have, uh, because alpha part, an alpha particle has more charge, then it is more ionizing than the rest because it is going to, because it has more protons, therefore it will have more electrons. 
Therefore, it can easily knock out more electrons or it can easily gain more electrons from air molecules in air, I mean from, from air atoms or atoms in air, or it can easily knock out more electrons in atoms in air. That's what we mean by ionization. So these radiations, these radiations knock electrons out of atoms, making them charged. However, I wanted to note that ionization in living cells is most likely going to damage the cell. And damage to genes can be passed on to offsprings, causing mutations. Of course, we know mutations, that is sudden, sudden change in the genetic makeup. So ionization is entirely referring to knocking out electrons in atoms of air molecules if the alpha particles or any other particle is passing through air. So they lose their energy as they knock out electrons in atoms of in atoms of air molecules. That is what we call ionization. And the higher the charge they have, the more the electrons they are going to knock out, the more energy they are going to lose. That means the more highly ionizing they would be. That's what we call ionization. You'll not be asked to explain ionization, I think, in AS physics. Let's illustrate a uh, penetrating power of these radiations by a simple diagram here. So we have alpha, beta, and gamma radiations. We notice that alpha particles will easily be stopped by paper, but beta particles can penetrate paper and only to be stopped by about three millimeters of aluminum. Then gamma radiations are going to penetrate paper. They will penetrate aluminum. They even try to penetrate lead. So a small amount, they are only being reduced by lead. If we want lead to completely stop them, then lead should be very, 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 very thick. It could be, it should be a thick, a very thick material of lead, which is going to absorb all of them. So that's why we say they are highly penetrating. They can't penetrate uh, air, they can penetrate uh, unlimited meters in air, only to be stopped by a very, very thick material of lead and concrete. Those are the gamma radiations. Let's try to compare their deflection in a magnetic, in an electric and magnetic field. Of course, in, um, in an electric field, the alpha particles are going to be, of course, in an electric field, we have positive and negative plates. So the alpha particles, because they are positively charged, they are deflected towards the negative plate. The beta plus are going to be deflected towards the uh, the beta minus, this is going to be beta minus. This is beta minus. They are going to be deflected towards a positive plate. Because gamma radiations have no charge, they just pass through the electric field without being deflected. But I want you to notice, if we had beta plus particles, they will be deflected following an identical path, just like the beta minus towards the other plate. So this will be the path for beta. I want to draw an identical path. So beta plus would be uh, deflected on the same side as an alpha particle. Now you may ask yourself a question, why is the deflection of beta particles relatively larger? Of course, when we talk about deflection, we're talking about the angle from the original path. This is the angle I'm talking about. Compare beta and, uh, and theta. I mean, I'll compare all this angle here. Let me call it, um, which Theta is taken, gamma is taken, alpha is taken. Okay, I call that theta one and this is theta two. You notice that theta two is much bigger than theta one. So theta two, beta particles undergo much deflection than uh, alpha particles. I think that is easy to notice or to see why beta particles undergo much deflection than alpha particles. Of course, we know that beta particles are extremely light particles. Their mass is extremely small. Therefore, when they pass through uh, 
when they pass through an electric field, they are most likely going to experience a very large, a very large force. So because alpha and beta particles have opposite charges, that is beta minus, they are going to be deflected in opposite directions. Beta particles are much lighter. They are much lighter than alpha particles. Therefore, less for, they require less force to change their direction. Hence, beta particles are deflected more than alpha particles. So, I want to write this here, beta particles. are much lighter they are much lighter than alpha particles therefore require less they require less force to change therefore require therefore require less force to change its uh, direction hence beta particles Beta particles are deflected more They are deflected more than alpha particles Okay, so because beta particles are much lighter than alpha particles They therefore require less force to change uh, their direction and hence Beta particles are deflected more than uh, more than alpha particles Okay, we shall not talk about how they behave in a magnetic field, but we have briefly talked about an electric field. And remember, electric field is no longer part of AS physics. So you also may not expect a question about electric field or even their behavior in an electric field in AS physics. However, we know that when these particles that have charge enter an electric or magnetic field, as long as they are moving at, uh, as even if they are at rest in an electric field, they will be deflected. In a magnetic field, it depends on, on whether they are moving at any angle to the magnetic field or not. If they are at rest in a magnetic field, as we, you will see in paper 4, they may not move. But if they are moving, I mean, if they are moving at an angle in a magnetic field, they will experience a force. If they are at rest, they will not experience a force. And if they are moving parallel to the magnetic field, they may still not experience. They may still not um, experience a force, as you will see in paper four. For now, we just want to say, beta particles and gamma and alpha particles are deflected when they enter into an electric field or a magnetic field. Gamma radiations, because they have no charge, they are not going to be affected. In a magnetic field, you will use Fleming's left hand rules. Fleming left hand to tell the direction in which the particles are actually going to be deflected. That is uh, the deflection of the alpha, beta, and gamma radiation in an electric field. This is a question I expect you to think about. Explain why you would expect beta minus particles to travel further through air than alpha particles. Explain why you would expect beta minus particles to travel further through air than alpha particles to give you a hint or to, to give you what to think about you should think about ionization one ionization depends on charge beta minus particles have a charge of positive i mean negative e they have a charge of negative e and alpha particles, alpha particles have a charge of positive 2e. So alpha particles are most likely going to be more ionizing than beta particles. And therefore, alpha particles will travel a shorter distance as compared to beta minus particles. So alpha
alpha particles have more charge. Then beta minus particles and thus are more ionizing. in air then beta minus particles thus are more ionizing air than beta minus particles hence would travel shorter distance Or you can write the other way around. That is, beta particles have a smaller charge, have a less charge than alpha particles, and thus are less ionizing in air than uh, alpha particles, and hence would travel further, a further distance compared to alpha particles. I think lesson two should stop here. I think lesson two should stop here. Until next time, bye bye.